So, Josh, brother, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate uh, your time tonight. Yeah, it's good. To, it's good to be here. I was excited. I was looking forward to this uh, all day. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that, man. So, with that being said, you're a busy guy. I'm. Uh, I'm glad I was able to tie it down long enough for this uh, podcast. But uh, take us through kind of what your day was like today. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I'm a teacher. So that's yep. uh, that's exciting, but that's also uh, exhausting at times. So, so right now I'm in the middle of uh, teaching a summer school. So uh, I'm actually both teaching summer school and I'm taking a teacher education course. So uh, I was up Mark last night and uh my course that i'm teaching for, for people that don't know it's a grade 10 civics course so you, everybody has to take civics and careers as part of grade 10 and uh so it's a compressed summer course but it means that a civics course is already so small and so compressed uh but we're basically doing the whole course in nine days so it's actually eight days the ninth day is just to get your marks so as a result like every day i'm online with my students i'm, I'm trying to help them out I'm responding to close to, if not over, about 100 emails a day from them, just needing help with stuff, um, and then dealing with, you know, helping out parents, stuff like that. So last night, I was like marking, and then midnight hit, and that was a whole new set of things to mark, because yeah. the deadline and the folders were all closing at midnight. So I was like, you know what, I can leave this and kind of be lazy about it, or if I get a jump on this now, I can kind of give students a heads up as to how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And also like let their parents know. So right. I ended up just staying up to like 530 in the morning marking, um, crashed for a few hours, got back up and already had a bunch of emails for my students to respond to yes. Colin, like, you know, a third of my class's parents. It's a weird dynamic because it's a compressed course. So some people love it. And there's like, you know, a third of my class getting, you know, 85 to 90s. And then there's like a third of my class really struggling to like be responsible and stay, stay on top of their work. So uh, I spent like most of my day doing that you know, working out coursework for my class, nice. as well as the class that I'm taking. Mm -hmm. um, and then I hit like, I hit a wall at probably like seven. And I messaged her and I was like, Hey, man, I'm gonna just go take a nap for a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and then just let me know when you're when you're free to go. Um, and then I just naturally woke up because I didn't want to be nice. late. So I, I just woke up and, 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 uh, and things worked out. But yeah, it's, uh, that's actually, Maybe not a typical day because I uh, tried to be more responsible with with, yeah. with, with my sleep, but uh, from a busy standpoint, it's pretty typical. I'm I'm usually kind of on the run all yeah. day. Or, or, on the run means different things. Uh, I think mm -hmm. during the pandemic, on the run means in front of a computer trying to do thirty things at once. Um, right. But uh, but yeah. <laughs> nice. Man. So you're an educator, a teacher, right? How'd you get yeah. into that? How'd you get into that? stream of um careers so that's a good question um you know my uh my mom was a music teacher uh when she was really young like she was a prodigy in music i think by 16 she was teaching you know tuitions and private lessons for 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 music because she was such a good musician and so growing up i had my mom around who was you know a pretty intense presence as a teacher and was always really diligent with us. You know, both my parents are really well educated. So education was really, really valued in our household. And that was really pushed. So I actually didn't like school that much, if I'm being frank. Um, I think I did pretty well. Um, I more enjoyed the non-academic side of school a lot. So, you know, extracurriculars and, and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, but like many young boys around, you know, my age, I grew up wanting to be a super saiyan. And so I started doing Taekwondo when I was like, nine maybe yeah. and uh, i was just blessed enough to to start with uh with an instructor who was a jamaican national champion he'd come over to canada he was a canadian national champion multiple times he was on the wow. on the national team a bunch so he was like really good doesn't play so around, then. yeah doesn't play around right so much like my mom he was super intense and you know was like we gotta work hard all the time mm -hmm. and so one year he was actually away uh, coaching the women's national team in Greece for the world championships. And I was not a black belt yet. I was probably like a, a red stripe or something, you know, one of those senior belts before you hit black belt in Taekwondo, yeah. but still pretty young, to be honest. Taekwondo is a little bit weird where you kind of progress quite fast in comparison to some martial arts. Yeah. Um, and so I was already training like, you know, twice a day, at least I used to come in, do the kids class, do the adults class, 
you know, end up crying at the end because I had to do so many push-ups for not listening. You know, kids are. I get that. Uh, but, dude. but I was 12, I think, when when he went away, and I had a chance to help teach classes, um, mm-hmm. just as kind of like an assistant, and you know, getting the opportunity to work with other people and showing them something that I knew that maybe they didn't know, or helping better understand something that I knew was really, really uh, awesome. Like I really enjoyed it. It was really positive. And I was like, this is something I really want to do. Um, and so that was at the back of my head. I, I started to try and look for as many opportunities as I could for leadership. So in school, I was trying to captain every team. You know, at Taekwondo, I was trying to look for every opportunity to try and help out. Um, once I hit high school, you know, I was trying to get involved in everything I could. You know, um, I, like I, I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm, I, I, I got involved in my church a lot in leadership roles there and, and, and running, you know, youth circles and things like that. So any chance I got, I was like, how can I refine the skill of being better as someone who kind of gets involved with other people, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really exciting to me. And that kind of led me on a path. And by probably grade 10, I knew I wanted to be a teacher for sure. And so I kind of pursued a very specific program that I wanted to get into that was, it actually doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was a joint program with Trent University and Queen's University. It was called nice. the Queen's Trent and Current Ed Program. Um, so it was actually really hard to get into, uh, but I think I frankly got in more on the merit of my extracurriculars, like my supplementary application than just my yeah. marks. Because a lot of people that got in were kind of, I don't want to say astrophysicists, but they were you were like, man, you do way too well. Are you going to be able to understand people who don't aren't as intelligent as you? You know, like, so, yeah. um, so that kind of led me on the path and I, I can get into that further, but that's, that's already a long enough story as to what led path of becoming an educator. Nice. That's yeah. pretty cool. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just wondering, my video keeps kind of focusing yeah. in and focusing out. Is that an issue? Not what for me. I... No, I don't, uh, okay. I don't know if like tapping on it to auto focus, it will fix it or because I know it's your phone. So. I'm going to do one of those. Out. Yeah, it should work. Nice. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's pretty cool. What was that program like? Like, how was that? Why is that not a uh, program right now? Yeah, so um, from my understanding, we were the last cohort that went through um, before they decided to kind of cut the program. Not because of us. Uh, I think it was a, a government funding issue. And oh. so the universities kind of had to look at uh, where they stood and, and, and what their priorities were. So Queens, uh, I, I don't know if this gets me in trouble, but Queens is a very, um, I want to say elitist um, kind of a institution. Right. And pro- they're, they're actually pretty open about that. Like they're, they're like, we know we're better than you, right? Yeah. So uh, whereas Trent is a very, uh, you know, a little bit more open, diverse. It's, it's kind of known for a reputation of being like a nice place to go. Um, so I think Queens, as soon as they found out that they would have to make some heavy decisions about uh, about about their program, they, they were like, we're going to get rid of everybody that has nothing to do with us uh, immediately. You know, so they were like, we're only focused on Queens, Queens students, and uh, the rest of you guys are second class citizens, which was kind of a shock to us. They actually, t- the, the, the associate dean actually told us that in a lecture once. He came in and told us like, uh, you know, uh, it's like being on a plane. And, you know, I'm the pilot and we're trying to sell seats and we're selling them to Queens. And then we got to bring on Trent. And then there's like, we had, they had like a joint program with Waterloo. There's Waterloo. And then everybody else that buys later is, uh, you know, they're just like trying to get a sale. And uh, who would I protect first? And we were like, that seems like the most unprofessional thing you would say to a group of pretty well-educated individuals. (laughs) So, so it was very odd, the nature of them cutting that program. I was so blessed to be in that program. The reason I went into it was because it was the best in both worlds. Trent Mm -hmm. at the time was known as the undergraduate program in Canada. Right. I think McLean's had ranked them like number one and Queens was known as the powerhouse, you know, faculty of education. Um, So through the program was actually quite difficult. We had to do, uh, you know, teaching practicum, uh, like from year one, which a lot of people that are teachers, they'll finish an undergraduate degree and then they'll pursue um, like a future degree in, uh, in education. But for us, we were doing practicum early. So that meant by the time we even got to teacher's college, we were far more experienced and a little bit more refined, I would say, nice. um, in some of our practice. So a lot of the stuff they were going over was kind of things we had had to learn on the fly, really. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a cool program. Unfortunate that it was kind of shut down. I think a lot of people benefited from being in that program. Um, I think joint programs that you, you know unique opportunities is important because mm-hmm. um, that's how you grow, right? If you're just exposed to the same closed network, 
it's very hard to kind of expand and get out of, outside of that comfort zone. Right. Now, with that being said, what is something that during your time in the Trent Queens um, education system, education system, excuse me, what is something that stood out to you? Like uh, it could be a lesson you learned or an important piece that you brought and that you use to this day. Yeah. So there's a few things that stood out to me. One major thing that I would say was kind of carving out your own identity. Um, Interesting. I think that uh, people often don't realize that you're supposed to make mistakes and you're supposed to fail sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you're going to have challenges and it's kind of about carving out and figuring out who you are and what you're made of, you know, so, so figuring out your own identity is, is hard when you're a young person. Um, so for me, that was, that was a big deal. Cause I had a pretty involved family growing up, you know, um, when I moved away to school, there was so much chaos, you know, I, I, I probably didn't do as well academically as I should have in my first year. And I struggled, right. People were like, are you sure you want to be here? Like, <laughs> so, uh, because of the pretty high pressure program I was in, I had to kind of figure things out myself and, and kind of prove to myself what I wanted to do. So I was like, no, I really want to be an educator. So I got to prove that I belong in this program because they're willing to say like, Hey, you can leave if you want. Um, because I wasn't really cut from that same mold. So yeah. carving my own identity, I felt was really, really important. And part of that is, is one of the values I think of any education is really learning about yourself and learning about time management and, and how to prioritize and how to balance you know, you've only got so much time in a day, right? So mm -hmm. I think carving my own identity helped me do that and kind of helped shape who I am today as an adult, right? So that was, that was huge for me. Nice. Now, are you allowed to fail students as a high school teacher? I'm always curious about that. So like I've this not is had actually good a and... really great question. Uh, I had a discussion with a senior educator. Uh, I won't say where, just because I'm not sure if that's an issue. But yes, the answer is you're not trying to fail anyone but students have the right to fail if they so choose. Let's put it that way. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so uh, Growing Success is a document that we use in education in Ontario that really helps kind of outline uh, the do's and don'ts, you know, best practices, things like that in education. And everybody can access it. You can, you can look it up online. Um, and it has pretty particular, pretty specific language in it about things like, you know, you can't give zeros to kids in elementary school and things like that. Nice. Where can um, you find that real quick? You could probably Google growing success okay. Ontario and it would probably come up. Um, so in that it's kind of difficult. Sorry, there's a fly flying around here. It's kind of difficult because uh, on a personal level, I actually don't take pride in, uh, in people not succeeding. It's actually kind of hard for me. Right. So if I'm working with someone right. and they choose not to succeed, that's actually like really no, heartbreaking for me. not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, full disclosure, I spent a lot of time today talking to families uh, where parents were surprised that their child wasn't doing work like they seemed they were all day on the computer. And I was like, whoa, that's a surprise to you. Okay. Um, so kind of pushing people to get up that hill and helping them yeah. succeed can sometimes be challenging. But the reality is, um, as long as you go out of your way to give people ample time and a fair opportunity to demonstrate their learning and understanding. They have a right to fail if they so choose in high school, uh, mm -hmm. which is sad. Uh, so the problem is that the opposite of that happens where a lot of people are like, well, you can't give me a zero. So they kind of play with play the game almost, as you would say. So they're like, yeah. you know, maybe don't hand things in. They try to rush everything at the end. And, and it's unfortunate because it defeats the purpose of education. You're like, did you actually learn something? Or did you refine the skill of like copying Memory. out? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So break it. Like, are you just good at like circumventing rules or did you actually learn something? Um, and learning something doesn't always have to be exclusively the curriculum, right? Like it can be, you, you can learn something in a science class that has nothing to do with science, right? Yeah, the skills that you're trying to learn, you want them to be transferable. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people have difficulty figuring out how things apply to them uh, in every course. But the reality is, you know, education brings a variety of different challenges to your life that you probably will need to mm. go through before you hit the real world um, and mm. life after high school. Boom. Hey, boom. I'm going to mix that in and make it a part of the intro. I love it. <laughs> I'm trying to like grab stingers from each episode, but that's its own project. So with I'm going to set up like three of them at some point during this chat. <laughs> that'd be sick. I'll add in a little extra music, you know, see how it goes. So with that though, dude, how do you, 
how would you teach failure to one of your students or make it easier for somebody, maybe not just students, but in general, how do you, how would you teach failure to someone of that grade 10 or grade nine, 10, 11, 12 age group? Cause that's a very, what do you, what do you mean by teach failure? Just so I have an understanding. So that they're able to not, I find often more often than not when people fail, they tend to either pick two, one of two routes. The first one is they go down a path of feeling sorry for themselves. Whereas the second one, or like feeling sorry for themselves, uh, not choosing to pick themselves up and move forward, but taking that as a loss and really beat up, which it does for a lot of us anyway. But there's also the way of picking up, going, okay, dust myself off. This isn't the end of the world. Let's work double as hard next time to understand and learn so that I could take something out of this for the next time. I mean, yeah, so I, I think that so hmm, so you're, you're kind of looking at it from like the pro versus con perspective right yeah so the reality is that everybody has different things going on right they have different experiences going on whether that's socially emotionally whatever the case may be um i feel like it's it's my job as an educator to try and instill uh good practices that they can kind of model to be successful and then they're going to make pretty um pretty clear choices over the course of their journey that will help determine their fate, right? So um, what I mean by that is, I'm gonna try and help someone understand how to appropriately plan things, how to try and you know maybe give them recommendations on how they spend their time, maybe advice on how they plan to do something. And then they're gonna go ahead and either take that advice or choose to do it their way or a different way or not right. do it at all, right? Okay. And throughout the course of the time that I spend with them, I'm constantly trying to reiterate some of these practices in the hopes that some of it will stick. For some people, they're going to see that and say, wow, that's awesome. I want to do it that way because that's clearly very easy. Mm -hmm. For other people, they may have a unique way that works for them that's even better. Um, the reality is a lot of young people don't have things figured out and I don't either. I don't, I don't feel like yeah, me staying to do something means that that's the only way to do things. It's right. just here's what works for me. Uh, here's something I think that works for a variety of different learning styles. Here's what works for a variety of different people and you pick up what works for you. So um, sometimes people have to realize failure. They have to get to that brink of failure. And failure means different things to different people, right? To one person, failure could mean absolute, like let's say in education, failure means failing a course. Some people, failure means not getting, you know, a 90 on something, right? So right. It, it, there's different levels to this game, like mm -hmm. anything. Um, but sometimes people need to experience that heartbreak or that emotional challenge in order to um, help understand what they don't want to get to again or to re realize the fault in, in what they were doing or what they need to adjust moving forward. Right. Um, the reality is that, you know, it's hard to say when you, when you talk about failure and how it's different for each person, like it means something to everyone else, but it's almost necessary in order for us to kind of move forward and be more self-aware and, mm -hmm. and, and be more comfortable. So what I don't want to do is become an enabler, right? I see, you yeah. don't want to enable someone to be okay with poor habits and being irresponsible with themselves. And that, that goes beyond, so, so education, I, like I, I work in education in a variety of different realms, right? I work right. in the classroom. I have a tutoring company of my own. I teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, yeah. And in all of those realms, there's very common themes, right? So you want to support someone, raise them up. You want to encourage them positively. You want to give them, you know, good practices that they can try to follow and, and make themselves succeed. But you also have to let them be willing to make mistakes because if you're doing so much to stop them from making mistakes, you're actually giving them a false sense of security, uh, which is not mm -hmm. going to be there. Like that, that, that blanket won't exist when you're not there. And the purpose of being an educator or a leader is not to, uh, to make everything revolve around you. Right. It's not actually about your ego or about everything running right. through you and having to function perfectly with just you. When you're gone, you know, that person or those students or those people need to be able to function well beyond you. So it's a weird balance of like failure and allowing people to fail, but also not mm -hmm. letting them get too low, but also not enabling them. Like it's a it's a really weird yeah. uh you're playing a balancing act. You're kind of like a dude with dreadlocks, slack, slack lining. Like you're just kind of doing one of these all the time. <laughs> trying, trying to, to figure out like balance, do I have yeah. this figured out? uh too much nice. one way too much the other yeah. so with that in civics and career specifically how do you teach 
like what are your methods of or strategies even for teaching different types of learning styles whether that be mm -hmm. kinesthetic auditory visual yeah so a good idea is to try and deliver content in a variety of ways right so one of that is you could do that via live video chat i do that with my class you could do that via written form which is often kind of unfortunately the most comprehensive way to do things so that is pretty common you can do that by providing them with different links and resources to try and help them you know uh attain depth of learning videos are fantastic you're also trying to read your audience right so right now learners are very different than when i was in school so i'm gonna have to use a lot more short form things i'm gonna have to use a lot more videos a lot more things that grab and keep their attention because their attention is being pulled in 300 different directions, right? Yeah. Um, so you are trying to give them a variety of different uh, methods of delivery. You're also trying to give them a variety of different um, options for their ability to express their understanding and their knowledge. So uh, a lot of assignments that I'll do in any any class will, will give someone options for major tasks, right? Okay. So it's not just like, write this essay. Well, that only works for a certain percentage of people. Right. You could also express your learning if done properly in a video. Right. Or you could express that in a poster, maybe depends on the task. Right. Or you could do that in a, you know, so, so there's a variety of different ways you can. The key is having a little bit of flexibility because learners are ever changing. People are different. And the purpose is not to have to like rule with an iron fist, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. In reality, education is kind of steering away from that because that doesn't fit most people. That's just forcing them into a box that doesn't actually help them grow and, and move forward. Sometimes that's necessary in certain realms, but for the most part, you actually want to have someone who is able to like, you know, learn in a variety of different ways and you're building up those skills over time. So offering options for differentiation is really important. What's your favorite part about being a teacher? Ooh, that's a hard one. Or maybe to help with uh, answering that question, think of it as what is also like maybe a favorite memory you have? So for me, like there's no greater joy to see someone work through something and come out better on the other end of it. Um, sometimes, Sometimes that's seeing someone going through something emotionally that nobody else knows about and you're kind of supporting them through it as a teacher or as an educator or as a friend, right? Um, sometimes that's just someone having a challenge where they can't understand or get something and then they work their way through it over time. Sometimes someone starts with terrible habits and terrible skills and you're building them up to get to a certain stage. Um, you know, um, so that would be for me the greatest joy, seeing someone go through something and come out better the other end of the tunnel. Uh, this is most clear to me in teaching jujitsu. So I teach Brazilian jujitsu, and the yeah. greatest joy of teaching jujitsu is taking someone from point A, having them kind of work out the kinks and go through the struggles and get to point B. You know, um, I've been really blessed to have the opportunity to, to run kids' programs for jujitsu mm -hmm. in three completely different academies in three completely different cities. And, you know, I've had students that have basically come from, you know, maybe not having as much success in other extracurriculars and they found their niche in jujitsu and they struggled. And then over time, being diligent, doing their best, having fun, putting in the time and the effort, they mm -hmm. came out, you know, phenomenal. I had students that came from, you know, having no hand-eye coordination to being, you know, provincial champions. And, wow. you know, it, it's, it's like the greatest joy. Like I, yeah, I, wow. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything in my personal jujitsu career that would bring me more joy than, you know, coaching my friend Ashton at the European championships to a bronze medal, nice. you know, um, or, you know, taking my student Kyla from, you know, someone who just was a really sweet kid to, you know, a provincial champion and like, you know, a future leader in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's probably the greatest joy of being a teacher or a coach or a mentor is that, is that journey of helping someone start somewhere, going through, you know, the grind and coming out the other end better for it. Mm -hmm. I like that, man. Well, uh, I was thinking about how you, like, uh, I want to ask you how you got into jujitsu, but 
right before I do, I noticed something today that kind of like in my head, I, I, I caught myself. I was like trying to, I was like prepping for this, right. Writing down all my final questions and stuff. And then I thought to myself, I was like, we've never rolled before. Really? Really? I, I feel like we have when I've come up to Sudbury. No, because I would have thought it would have been, uh, you know where I thought it was? That open mat at Body of Four. That's when I thought we would have. But if you think it's Sudbury, then we def- I definitely don't think. I was like, it did. Yeah, I, th- I think I roll with you at a, a night class at the, at the current location. Um, I don't, I don't I'm like 90% sure I did, actually. Yeah? Uh, yeah, because you were like. You were like, oh, man, you're making this look really easy. And I was like, I was like, no, nah, man, just keep going. Like, I remember it was a co- like you made a comment because I was I working know. on a skill while we were rolling and I just kept like passing or something like that. And then you were like, you were like, oh, man, like you said something effective. I can't like, remember. Yeah, I but I, like, I, I kind of yeah. kind of remember that because I rolled with you. And then right after that, I rolled with Corey. That makes Corey sense. Just, Corey like put the sauce on me. Like he was like, yeah. he was like, I'm going to take that belt off of you. Like Corey, <laughs> shout yeah. out to Corey. Corey's a good dude. dude yeah, shout out to him, man. He's uh. He's a hard worker, bro. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah, that's like which just hard work pays off, right? Like it's yeah. it's, it's a discipline, I, I think, and a consistency that kind of gets people to where they want in that. Like broken down into very, very, very simplistic language, discipline and consistency together, I think, are the best pairing. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in that environment too, right? Uh, when you yeah. train with monkey. Uh, so for those people that are listening in are, you know, my former professor, someone who was like family to me and, 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 and Glenn's current professor, Richard, Richard, Nenk, who we, we call him monkey is, is, you know, like the greatest of his generation in Canada, right? Like he's, he's it's the nuts. king of Jiu Jitsu and, um, and training coming up, training with him prepares you for life, man. Like I talked, like I talked to him the other day on the phone. I was telling him, I was like, yo, yeah, man, it was his birthday. Eh? Is where I went through something and you know, I just, I just you know, you kind of helped me through that phase. And now I'm the one giving that speech to other people. Like, it's so crazy. But that commitment to the craft, right? I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to work hard. And it doesn't matter what other people are saying, because talk is cheap, right? I'm just going to put my head down. And I'm going to work harder than everybody else. Like while everybody's mm-hmm. sleeping, while everyone's on Instagram, while everybody's worried about their own image and how they feel and what they're wearing, and how they do, I'm just going to work. And, and that builds like, like in jujitsu, yeah. that's incredible. Um, and that's oh, why gosh. everyone will then comment, oh, you train there? Oh, man. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just get a rest real quick before I roll with you. That's what it's like. And then, you know, in life, right, you're, you're more conditioned to deal with um, not trauma. <laughs> I want to say trauma, but, but, uh, but adversity, trauma. right? Adversity is not adversity. challenging for you, right? If you come yeah. from that environment, adversity is not challenging. You know, so coming up with my mom and then, you know, Master Creighton, my Taekwondo instructor, and then Monkey, like, I was so used to my role models being like adversity is something we go through every day so yeah. that reality isn't difficult. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, it's funny. I did like a try a try once with my fiance. Uh, it's just like a, you know, a, 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 a mini triathlon. So nice. you do like the swimming, you do the, the, bike, the, the, the bike and then you're running. And I barely trained for that because I was like, yo, I'm not going to take time away from jujitsu to go run. Like that's, that's absurd. Why would I do that? So I, so I went and swam like three times because I live near the Pan Am Center in Toronto. Nice. So I swam in the Pan Am Center like three times just to like be like, yeah, I love swimming. I think I'm a pretty good swimmer. Yeah. Let me just make sure I'm like, this has been a while. Hopped in and that's it. And I did the swim. And it was like, it was definitely not easy. Yeah. Uh, you could see people who weren't regulars on that circuit. Like the regulars were like ripping it up. You could see yeah, people who weren't regulars just like falling apart. And for me, I was like, huh my body is, is literally going to have to disintegrate before I stop this because I'm not, not stopping. Like I'm not stopping. I'm finishing this no matter what, no problem. And like, right. by the time I got off my bike for the running portion, I was like, yo, I'm fresh. And was just like bolting past people yeah. who had been biking past me like on your left. Right. Uh, your left. So that, that mental fortitude that you build in jujitsu yeah. or in whatever, whatever your craft is, right. If you can find something that you do, that forces you to build that mental fortitude through like just determination, hard work and consistency. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's unparalleled. Right. Nice, man. I love that. That's a, that's a good example. I think really good example of how everything can kind of like transition what you learn and stuff, but there's Absolutely. a, it's a similar, I have a similar story with monkey where it's specifically, I find 
he says a very, very key to the moment story. Like you'll ask him a question and it's never a direct answer, but it's, <laughs> it's this unreal story of like details and it, and you're like, what is going on? And then first you think, is that true? And then you think, this is incredible. And then, then you forget what the question was. And he says something, you go, oh, so what you're saying is, and the example I'm using is where I was like, what you're saying is never settle with. And he's like, no, nah, just never settle, no matter what it is. If you get a position, get the, you earn the position and you hold it and you look to advance. You never settle. Don't just camp out in certain places. Just look to work like be consistent keep going keep going keep going never settle with it i was like huh and like you said using those skills that you learned the lessons and try and transferring them over makes everything man when i go on runs similar to your story when i go on runs i don't run i used to a lot but now it's like it's all just mental it's like i can go through this i can go through this i can go faster i can go faster let's go you know it's it's all up here it's insane how much jiu-jitsu helps with everything else yeah, I think specifically that environment and that yeah. that mentor really pushes people to a different uh, a different level um, mentally. That, don't get me wrong; other other leaders, instructors, you know, coaches can do that. You know, my my current professor is unbelievable with how you know Marco Costa. He, he's yeah. fantastic with how he mentors me, how he guides me. In fact, he has a really good idea of understanding who I am where I'm at, my head's at, I'm a little bit older now, right? Where my priorities are, those kinds of things and, and having tough discussions. And, and so, so I don't want to take away. And he's also super tough, yeah. super incredible. But, but there's this weird, he's got more of like this, like uh, this Jedi aura to him, Marco. Whereas Monkey's got like this, I, I don't want to call it like, I, I don't know what to say. Like he's like, he walks in the room in a jujitsu academy and he's like, uh, trying to find a good comparative it's like the aura pe people talk about when prince walks in a room but just take away like all the effeminate qualities <laughs> take away literally the all of them yeah. and put in like the dope like i'm ready for anything Dude. in life uh, reality <laughs> it was the weirdest thing every single time he walks into a room i hear like i hear that dmx bark at the beginning of every song <laughs> i was like there was, was like, actually monkeys. there was a super fight that i had once and i uh I think I picked a DMX song as a walkout no song. No kidding. And like, you just heard the dogs and then like the clap. <laughs> and it was, it was yeah. me in here and the song started and he looked at me and he was like, that was a dope track you picked right there. And then we just walked out. It was incredible. Jeez, I, was like, I was like, okay, That's we're on the sick. same wavelength today. That's good. Nice. So how did you get into jujitsu originally? So a lot of people have this great uh, inspiring story about how Hoist Gracie changed their lives. Uh, with all <laughs> due respect to Hoist Gracie and uh, to the original UFC, yeah. I actually didn't like Hoist Gracie when I first saw him. Uh, it was a very uh, biased, uh, difficult uh, point of view. And let me tell you why. Because I did Taekwondo. I was like, yo, the Taekwondo guy in the UFC tournament sucks. I know at least 20 guys who would have been way better. That was my mindset. Nice. Right? Very, a very ignorant point of view, if you're being honest now. <laughs> yeah. But the reality was... Right, like I was, I was competing, training, competing with national champions and world level medalists. So I, hmm. in my head, I was like, I was like, yo, you got to get somebody better than this guy. I know forty year olds who could fight better than this dude that was in the yeah. UFC tournament, right? So um, I hadn't drunk the Kool Aid of Jiu Jitsu yet. Um, over time, it was clear that was something that was that was dope and that was very effective. It was clear wrestling was also very, very. Uh, a very good skill to learn, but there mm -hmm. wasn't really any wrestling around where I grew up and there wasn't really any jujitsu. Um, I would say the turning point for me was Damian Maya. Uh, Damian Maya was a multiple time world champion and he kind of came into jujitsu initially to just kind of show jujitsu to the world. Right. So I remember like there was a fight where someone was like interviewing him and he was like, I don't like to hurt people. I'm just here to show jujitsu to the world. And he like wouldn't punch people. He would like slap them sometimes to open them up and then he'd like choke them. But he was so systematic and so methodical in what he did. It was very much like the way that I had learned to do Taekwondo, right? So the Gracie family, uh, I don't want to take anything away from their contributions to yep. the world and to martial arts because it's incredible. But to me, they were very arrogant. Uh, 
And so the arrogance, my own arrogance coming from Taekwondo, right? Because I did, I did IT. There's a, there's a couple main styles of Taekwondo. Yeah. There's ITF, the International Taekwondo Federation, which is a little bit more like semi-contact kickboxing and WTF, which is what they do in the Olympics, yeah. uh, the World Taekwondo Federation. And that's more exclusively kicks, right? So yeah. I come from that ITF branch where you're like, yo, some of these guys went on to kickboxing. Some of these guys went on to fight like in MMA and things like that. So, so to me, I was like, oh, like what? Like, oh, these guys are arrogant like i guess they're good but whereas maya was very humble he was very methodical he was very you know respectful of people around him he had a frame much like i did when i was a teenager so i was like oh this this guy like something to watch out for so i started to really like him um and it was like i gotta do jujitsu man i i like i'm obviously wrong here mm -hmm. um i gotta step it up and so um it became a dynamic where i was like i gotta find jujitsu i remember calling to find an academy and I don't want to name the name because I don't, I don't mean any disrespect to this instructor, phenomenal instructor, really good person, but they were someone that were, you know, you know, let's just say in Toronto where I live and I called cause they had a website. This is like when now everybody's got a phenomenal website. This is when nobody had websites, right? They had a website and I called them and the fees for jujitsu were double my fees for Taekwondo. So I was like, cool. Can I train? And my dad was like, yo man, you got to figure out how to, earn, how to earn this money. Cause like, yeah. they, you know, all respect. I want you to do what you got to do. I think this is a great idea. Cause my dad's a huge UFC junkie. Right. Nice. But he was like, he was like, yo, you got to figure this out. Cause that, that's not, uh, it's not cheap. Um, so I ended up having to wait on jujitsu and then uh, in between uh, school and university, my parents kind of surprised me and they bought me a, uh, a summer membership to a massive gym in, uh, in Toronto. And so the gym was actually on the opposite side of the city. So I live in East Scarborough. This gym was like in West Toronto. So I actually used to take public transit three hours a day to go to this gym to train. So I would go in, I would do like a kickboxing class. And then if there was a jujitsu class, I would try to take part. And I was so excited. And, um, it's so funny because this, at this time, these guys did pretty much just no gi and they were really well known. They had some really, really good guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, it was funny because when you start jujitsu and you don't really have a lot of structure, uh, you just dive into it and you're like, yeah, I watch UFC and yeah. you just get handled. And, uh, Darson Hemmings actually, I don't know if you know Darson. He's actually like a, a black belt. Now he trains at Toronto BJJ, but he used to train at this gym at the time. And he, he was just like a savage. This was like right before, I think before he won ADCC trials, but he was already like an up and comer. He was a big deal. And I remember I rolled with him and I had like no experience and he must've tapped me like 18 times in like a roll. Like it was like, every time he tapped me, I'd go, what was that? And you do something, I'd be like, what was that? He was like, arm bar. I was like, what was that? He was like, wrist lock. What was that? Toe hold. What was that? Ankle lock. Like, it was just like, every time he did something, I was like, that was cool. What was that? <laughs> and then I was so excited about training. I did like a handful of classes maybe. And then I got, I have really bad uh, eczema. And so I'm really susceptible to picking up stuff from people. And after every training, I would shower at that gym. It was a nice facility, but I, I actually ended up picking up a really bad uh, staph infection. And so... I wasn't, oh. I like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, what's this? And I went to a doctor. They were like, yeah, this is bad. And I was like, did I get it from training? My doctor was like, you could have picked it up off the bus, man. Who knows? But you can't train, obviously. And I was like, yeah, shoot. So it kind of like ruined my dreams because like for a few weeks, I was like actually getting to train and uh, it was really fun. And I enjoyed doing boxing classes, kickboxing classes, and especially looked forward to jujitsu. Yeah. But it was like really short lived. So I only did like a handful of classes. Um, and then I went to, uh, to Trent, to Peterborough. And ahead of time, I had kind of done my research and I called and talked to Stu Landry, who ended up being like, he's, Stu and I are like super close. Stu ended up being kind of like a mentor for me and he kind of took me under his wing. And so my first year, I couldn't really train because I was, I was on residence and it's kind of chaotic. It was a lot going on in my life, but I still kind of joined the judo club just to like do something. And then uh, I got to Stu's literally like the first week I got into second year. I like showed up at Stu's and was like, I got to train with you, man. I got to train with you. And I was kind of this like really skinny, like 145 pound, but like six feet tall kid. And Stu was like, Oh, cool. Come on in, man. And he's like an encyclopedia of jujitsu. So he like, he saw that I wanted to train. He saw that I, I, you know, was not a complainer. I was there to work hard. I was like, you know, trying to be positive and, and, and be part of the team. And he really, really took me under his wing. 
And so Stu was, was a big, big influence and, and pretty much the re reason that I'm doing jujitsu today. So he kind of took me under his wing. Monkey was kind of his professor. So he would bring me to travel with him and Tim, my old teammate, uh, to meet Monkey on weekends in Ajax, in Oshawa, nice. in, uh, uh, no, maybe not Oshawa, in Ajax, in Scarborough a lot, right? Makes and sense. we would train. It would be a, a closed session. Like it used to be like Stu, English. I don't know if you know English, Adrian, uh, Govna. Yeah. Um, Tim Gain, uh, this guy Fabrizio, who, who's, who's at Gringo's now, really, really yeah. good guy. Um, and then like a couple other of like English students, depending on where we were at. And it was just like intense. And they were really good to me. Like nobody was ever trying to hurt me. They were really good, uh, you know, mentors for me. But uh, Stu would take me wherever, like wherever he's going, you want to come? I was like, I'll do whatever I can. So I was just like at that academy all the time. Nice. Guys there were super cool, you know, um, some of the guys who were older, because I was a student, right? Like Jay Cannon was a good buddy of mine. He would drop me home all the time because I would go across the city to train every day or across the town, I guess, city, yep. town, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that really got me going. And from there, it just took off, right? Like passion and, and, and commitment really takes you, takes you places in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's a long speech. I hope that wasn't like too much information. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, that's perfect. That's what I uh, aspire to get into with each guest. And so far, it's been pretty good. So, yeah. Dude, uh, now you mentioned like you related uh, my teaching question or education question, favorite memory, favorite like thing about it. I'm curious, do you have a favorite moment in jujitsu, like for your own personal journey, right? So because jujitsu, I think is like you can do it with people, solo, whatever, but you definitely have help to improve. It's not a solo thing. Like You can't get really good just hanging out in your basement, watching videos by yourself. So. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, this is good. I hope this isn't really cheesy, uh, but yeah. I don't really talk about this much, but, uh, I would say the coolest, my, I have a lot of incredible memories from jujitsu. I've Better literally off. transformed my life to really revolve around jujitsu and I can get into that in a little bit, yeah. but, and, and that's kind of, it ties into my life after high school actually is, is, is where jujitsu took me. But, um, there's like a lot on my list, you know, time spent in Brazil, um, you know, uh, a lot of good memories with Monkey, good memories with Professor Marco, good memories with, with Stu. Um, I would say, you know, tournaments brought a lot of joy to me. Coaching at tournaments were incredible. I would say my personal favorite memory was when I won the Naga Worlds um, in New Jersey a couple of years ago. Um, Naga, for people that don't know much about jiu-jitsu, there's a lot of different organizations. So the main one that people kind of align themselves with is the IBJJF. Um, you know, it's an international organization for the most part, and they have like a massive world championships every year. Um, there are other organizations. Uh, Naga is more of like a North American brand, and the North American Grappling Association. Grappling, and yeah. uh, they've been running tournaments for years and years and years. And I always wanted to do a Naga tournament, and I never had. I missed the phase. They just kind of left Canada when I had been starting Jiu Jitsu, I think, or maybe just, just after I'd started. So uh, my buddy, Mike Aviado, Mike, shout out to Mike. He, uh, he's a world champion at every belt level. He's, he's an unbelievable guy, good teammate. Um, Mike and I hatched this plan. I had just moved to Toronto from Sudbury some, some time, a few months recently, but before that. And I was like, yo, I'm going to compete as much as possible. So I competed like in three weeks, I competed three times kind of thing. I was doing every tournament I could. And I was like, Mike, I want one of those belts because Naga has these massive belts, right? That they give out. I actually have one here. Nice. Pull it up. Yes, it's sir. In my, it sits in my living room. <laughs> it's probably like WWE style belts. That's right? nuts. Um, so they give out these belts to people who win certain divisions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was like, Mike, I want one of those belts so bad. And Mike's like, I'm gonna get one of these belts too, man. We're going to do it together. Harold and Kumar. My, for people that don't know, Mike's Mike Filipino. So we were just like, we're going to go down. <laughs> we're going to do it. H and K style. So we like drive overnight to get to, uh, Newark, New Jersey yeah. in the middle, of, like early morning, our Airbnb is not working out. The guy's trying to scam us for something. That's not what it is. You know, Mike somehow works out something with the guy. The guy kicks his parents out of another property he owns and sends us there. It was super weird. Um, we got to make weight. So we have to like find a sauna so that, you know, we find one, it's not working. We have to go somewhere else. We're sitting in there just like losing our minds because we've been traveling overnight. So it's messed up our weight cut. We make the weight, we show up to the venue. It's awesome. My aunt and uncle happened to live nearby. And at the time, my uncle owned a restaurant, which was nice. like really well known. So we went to that restaurant after a win. 
probably not a good idea to just eat restaurant food. We should have had a little bit more diligent thing. But we do our thing and we show up to the tournament day off. Mikey does amazing. He 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 wins a belt in no gi. He wins a belt in gi. He does a you know he does a Mikey thing. Mikey always puts on. He's he's a guy who really shows up. Yeah, the nice. biggest challenge for me is you know I am more of a uh, I, I don't want to crap on myself, but I'm more of a, a team guy. I love to train hard. I love to learn. I love to grow. I want to be a professor one day in jujitsu. You know that's that's my goal. I compete to be better and to have better experiences. But full disclosure often there is something ridiculous that happens, you know, like, you know, I'll pop something the week before the tournament or something goes wrong, or I just mess up and wet, you know, wet the bed and don't do a good job at a tournament. So that was the day that everything came together. Nice. And my bracket was stacked. Like it was a massive bracket. Um, It wasn't as big as the IBJJF worlds. Like I've been in 130 man brackets at IBJJF worlds got, you know, won three matches and, and still not, still not put a dent in it. It have close to a medal. Um, this was probably, I think, like 32 guys. Uh, but there were really good teams represented there. You know, BTT was there. Um, Lloyd Irvin had, like, an army that they brought. And nice. they're a big deal on the East Coast, right? There were a bunch of good teams there. And a bunch of dudes were, like, sponsored and stuff. So they're all wearing these, like, intense geese. Um, so I was, like, obviously pretty nervous. But I was just kind of like, uh, you know, let's go. It's go time. Yeah, like I got to just here. let my game flow. And whatever happens, happens. And... Um, you know, match by match, I went through, I imposed my game, I, I won each match, you know, definitively. Uh, on the other sides of the brackets, there were other really good competitors who were putting on a show. There was, I was like, I was watching like mini versions of guys I follow on Instagram. I was like, oh, that guy looks like Herbert Santos. He's just like dropping everyone on their face. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that guy's like, that guy looks like Leandro Lowe and this guy's like this. Mm-hmm. And this guy. Like it was, I wasn't hyping myself up. I was just like, these guys are amazing. This is kind of awesome to be in this bracket. And um, uh, I had done one Naga before, actually. I'd gone to, uh, to, 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 to one before, and I'd done really well at Blue Belt. But this was, like, the big, the big deal for them, right? This is mm-hmm. a big tournament people traveled from. Like, people had come from, like, Florida. This was in New Jersey. People had yeah. actually driven from Florida to do this tournament. Wow. People had come from, like, Canada. It was, it was cool. So, um, so I worked through the bracket. And in the finals, it's me versus this beast from Lloyd Irvin's. And I was like, man, I made it to the finals. This is incredible. And the entire Lloyd Urban team is there. And they've all got all their colored belts, have got these massive belts around their shoulders. And they're all doing like, they're like, they're eh, like they're throwing up their gang signs. And they're all like being rowdy. And everyone's going nuts. And they're like, I don't remember the guy's name, but they were like hyping him. They're like, you got this. You've been owning everyone. This guy was like decimating all of the opposition. I was a little bit more like slow, methodical, take my time. You know the stuff. You come yeah. from the same. You come 100%. from the same. 100%. Right? Take yeah. my time and then get to the stuff kind of thing. Right? Yeah. So, Match starts. Mikey's the only one in my corner. So this little Asian guy. The belts are too big for him. He's holding <laughs> my camera. He's like, okay, Josh, we're going to go do the Marco Costa grip fighting system. Let's go, buddy. Right? Meanwhile, everyone yeah. else is like, eh, they're like screaming, yeah. they're going crazy for Team Lloyd Irvin. I was like, it was definitely intimidating. Um, you know, Jameel Hill was there. He's, he's a world champ, black belt world champion now. He was amazing at the time. I looked up to him. I was like, holy crap, Jamil's coaching against me. Oh my gosh, like, a bunch of these guys, I recognize them. I know who they are. Wow. So I was like, I just got to do my thing. He was super strong. We grip fought. Uh, I was able to, like, I think pull guard. I was like, I know in my head I got to get under him. I got to sweep. I got to get on top. And I just got to keep him there. And that's literally what I did. Like, there was a bunch of scary exchanges standing up. I was able to pull. I got under him. I swept him. I came on top. And then I gave the pressure. And it was, like, consistent pressure for the rest of that match just like taking his life, like exactly the way Monkey has taught all of us, right? Just like slowly wither away. Yeah. Every option I is worse than the last. And yeah. he was a very game opponent, so I don't want to take anything away from him. He was right. amazing. It was an honor to fight someone that of that <laughs> skill and that ability. It brought out the best in me, right? And then at the end of the match, Mikey's like, okay, Josh, there's like 30 seconds left, brother. You go free. Go crazy, man. It's time to go. And I was like, yo, I got to own this. And I like ended up arm barring him to finish the match. And I won, and I, like, couldn't believe it. Like, I stood up, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, we did it. Like, like That's it. That's amazing. This is it. Yeah, so, like, we got the belt. I, like, Mikey and I got changed. We went back to my uncle's restaurant to surprise him. We're, like, walking through the middle of nowhere, New Jersey, like, WWE wrestlers with all these big, like, things, like, these, these, that uh, thing. So, that, I would say that's a long, convoluted story, and I hope people enjoy these stories and don't hate yeah. that I talk so much. But, honestly, that trip brought me so much joy. And it was such a lead up. Like we had trained so hard. We had been so prepared. I actually got my butt kicked 
in the Nogi earlier in the day because I had to do the expert division and the oh. rules for Naga are a little bit different. So it was a lot for me. Like people were getting points for like chasing submissions and usually in IBJJF rules, that's like, oh, thank you for the two points. I'll come up when you chase a footlock. But instead he was getting points and I had trained for it, but it was still a little bit hard for me with the pace mm-hmm. and you know all the heel hooks and stuff. It was, it was crazy, uh, but I had hurt myself. And then to do that in the gi later on, like with an injury and with everything going on and being, you know, everyone cheering against me, it was okay. super, super cool. So I would say that's probably my favorite memory, no but there are countless memories of things that have brought me so much joy. And a lot of them actually have nothing to do with me. They're usually someone else's success, bringing me joy or right. someone else's great experience, bringing okay. me joy. You know? That's the teacher inside of you speaking right there. I guess. I think that's kind of selfish of me to actually say that my favorite moment was about me. <laughs> no, dude, Ironically, it's your moment. Yeah. But, it's uh, your moment. I've definitely, I've definitely shed a tear or two, uh, not for that. Like that for me, I'm just like, that's awesome. I did this for my team. I did this for my family. I did this for my friends and all my supporters. But when my teammates or my students win, I'm like, I'm like so proud of them. I'm more proud of them than they are of themselves, you know? So it's. <laughs> nice. That's, that's incredible, dude. That's awesome. Yeah, I hope thanks. to, uh, I hope to get to a point with jujitsu where I feel confident, confident enough instructing a class and seeing that and being like a part of that development in the younger uh or in the youth so yeah man it's super it's super super enriching and it's it's super like you you get so much out of it from that experience as well Mm -hmm. Um, so it's 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 awesome nice so with that then um this is how do i segue this this has been a couple moments pretty entertaining i think and now i'm curious do you have another passion project hobby Either one, either one, you want to call it. You do stand-up comedy, correct? I yeah, like, I've, been so, I've been known to dabble. Um, yeah, a little bit for sure. Nice. Um, How the heck did you get started in that? Like, what was that tipping point? To, uh, you go, all right, I'm gonna grab this microphone and make this crowd laugh. Laugh. So, in my family, uh, everyone is really intense. Uh, we're always yelling. We're always fighting uh, mm. and it's all love, right? Like it's just the way it is. We are also always roasting each other. Like at a young age, I had to have such a thick skin because we're constantly just getting roasted. Like everybody thinks it's funny. Like sometimes my mom will tell jokes as an adult now about my sister and I. And I'm like, yo, those are traumatic memories. What are you laughing about? <laughs> so, um, you know, I was always like, you know, a little bit funny in school. I don't want to overdo it a little bit, but people, people liked my sense of humor for the most part. Um, when I got to high school, uh, my high school actually used to put on a really well done, really professional uh, talent show. And nice. they took it like really seriously. Like they, they used to, like they had like a whole lighting rig set up. They had like a, a massive stage. They had all sorts of performances. And I was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go do some stand up. And I like wrote all this original material. I like showed up, uh, I did my set, they were like cracking up and it was weird. It was like, it was at the time, you know, American Idol was like the main show you could go on for like talent. So I had never done something like this, like an audition of that nature. So it was a bit awkward being in like an empty auditorium, having three of my, you know, three teachers that hadn't taught me yet, just like cracking up at jokes of mine because I was already intimidated by them. So then I ended up doing like a set um, for our talent show it went amazing. Like people, people's first set usually suck. So I, I expected to suck and it went really well. And uh, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Uh, and then I ended up doing it again the following year. I started doing like a lot of like small MC gigs at like, you know, different like family, friends, parties and stuff like nice. that, where it'd be like someone's, you know, wedding anniversary or, or birthday or something, you know, someone's big celebration. I'd like do like a little bit of emceeing where I'd like, sorry, emceeing, not like rapping, emceeing, like leading, you know, running the event and kind yeah. of like getting people into games and things like that. And, and humor was a huge part of that. Um, one of the sets I did actually at my talent show, someone came to me and they were like, you should come to second city. Like you, you need to quit what you're doing right now and work on your craft. And I was like, yo, I'm like 16. So uh, I want to be a teacher. Yeah. So, you know, like, I'm just like, well, actually, I don't know if that fits with my Taekwondo and rugby schedules. So I don't know if I can make it. And they're like, no, nah, man, you got to quit. I was like, I don't think my mom's going to like it if I tell her that I'm going to go try. I'm going to go downtown <laughs> to work on comedy. Like, that's not it's not the right trajectory here. I want to be a teacher, I think. And they were like, all right, man, you're lost. And um, I kind of regretted not uh, maybe pursuing or dipping yeah. my foot in that a little Trying bit more. Yeah. Um, 
like I was a teenager, so I think I probably wouldn't have been allowed to go, but at least being like, hey, like, dad, you want to come with me downtown and see if they'll let me in to do, whole, like, <laughs> do a couple sets at, at different clubs and stuff yeah. like that? Um, so, so a lot of time went by, a lot of people, you know, would be like, oh, I remember when you did comedy, when are you coming back? My mom will just like ask me to start doing sets in like the middle of the room all the time. She'd be like, come on, do a Trinidadian accent and like do this and do that. Your jokes are so funny. And I'm like, okay, this is kind of like, it's embarrassing. It's like if someone asks you to just like start doing dance in the middle of your bedroom, they'd be like, come on, do everyone knows you're good. Like, it's really weird, right? <laughs> Stand up's a weird, it's a weird medium, right? Like if you sing and you suck, people will still be like, so brave. But if you go on stage and you try to make people laugh and bring joy and you don't or you don't land, nobody is like so brave. They're like, yo, that guy's so It's like the worst medium if you have like confidence issues. So yeah. luckily, like my entire life, people have been trying to break me down. So confidence is not that <laughs> yeah. challenging for it's me. Like room full of strangers isn't too bad. Parents, left, right, and center yeah. has like helped me be like not afraid of a failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also like, helped me be diligent in writing and stuff like that. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm like heavy into stand-up. I'm an aspiring stand-up comic. Uh, what I did was a close friend of mine uh, had been moving away to join the military and we had gone to a show together. Like um, her fiance had, had come and my fiance had come. We kind of went on like a double date and she was like, you need to do this. And I ended up like chatting with one of the comics afterwards to be like, man, this was so awesome. Like, it's so weird. You went this way with this joke. I had a similar joke. What do you think? And I was like feeding him my line. And he was like, he's like, Oh, that's hilarious. He's like, you should come do some open mics. And I was like, nice. yeah, you know, I live in Scarborough. It's this is that. That sounds awesome. I need to get on that. And then like, it wasn't until my friend moved away that I was like, Oh, I should have been doing this when, when this friend was here. And so I kind of just started getting on it. And so, you know, I've done some sets like in Toronto downtown, um, in, in, in Durham, like in Ajax done a couple sets. Um, we went to New York. Uh, I was fortunate to try and, and, and get in a set there. Um, again, I don't want to overstate where I'm at in the game, right? Nobody's like going out of the way to like try and pay me to do like big events. I'm not on Netflix or anything. I'm just like an amateur comic uh, that enjoys the medium. I enjoy the process. It's super fun for me. Um, it's really stress, you know, it relieves a lot of stress. It, it, it induces stress initially because it is a lot. I, I don't know if people have ever tried something like that, but um, it's it's a lot. It's, it's an intense experience, uh, but it's something I want to continue. And I was very excited uh, to kind of get rolling this year in the pandemic kind of, um, I don't know how to say it stabbed my life in the heart. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> yeah, no when the kidding, pandemic's man. done, I have so much material that I'm dying to work on. And like, I have so many friends that are like, I want to come see you. I want to come see you. Yeah. So, you know, even, even if I'm never going to be like great at something like this, I think art forms are like that where you just have to appreciate the fact that not everything is about being the best. Sometimes it's just about like being your best self. And, you know, um, I think if life after high has taught me anything, it's about trying to be your best self. Unreal. I like That's that a lot, dude. <laughs> nice. I appreciate that, dude. Yeah, there's a, um, well, here's what I'll do. <laughs> when I get my house and I have my massive housewarming party, we'll kick <laughs> it off and you can MC. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'll line That's it up. That's awesome. That's awesome. Dude, I'll line it yeah. up based on your schedule. So. Yeah, I was like, I'm getting married, and I was like, yo, should I do like a set at my wedding? Is that, are people expecting me to tell jokes? As like a uh, vows or? Because, no, 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 I can't, okay. Yeah, so I'm actually yeah. Catholic, so like, I can't do like, uh, yeah, like true. Brooklyn Nine, Nine jokey vows and stuff like that. It's like a little bit more serious. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Incredible, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Don't even get me started on that. That's a good show. show. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's yeah. Awesome. They also tackle like the real issues, which I like. It's weird yeah. that someone can get upset about everything and I, and I respect people's uh, decision to do so. But like they've tackled issues like, you know, they've tackled racial issues, they've, they've tackled, you know, uh, blue issues, they've tackled all sorts of different challenges that I think is really cool. I think you kind of have a responsibility when you're, when you're an influential show to do that. And I feel like they've tried. So I've been really impressed with the way they've gone about uh, navigating through some of the uh, relevant issues of today. You know, like I love The Office. That's one of my greatest shows of all time. But it was a different time, right? The way they navigated through issues is very different and things you couldn't do today. Whereas Brooklyn Nine-Nine is kind of unique in the sense that the world is so different from what it was even 10 years ago. So yeah. the way they navigate through a lot of current issues is very unique. Yeah, it's really good. There was that one issue. Um, I remember when Terry gets stopped in his neighborhood yep. by a white I, that was That was the one that came to mind right yeah. off the bat. As soon as you it's said it. Great, like, yeah. great, you know, really awesome good. episode. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really good. Yeah, and there were moments that I was like, ooh, are they going to? No, 
they kept it straight straight face they didn't make like because yeah. jake peralta's character typically will do that little like add a jab or a comment at the end but there were a few mm-hmm. times where he didn't and i was like okay that's how i know they're taking it a bit more serious yeah it was great so now do you have a a, a go-to set that you like to do when somebody puts you on the spot because listen, no, sorry, I, one sec. If you, if you were a rapper or if you did music like that, I would ask you to freestyle for me. So instead, this that was my follow up question. That's uh, do you have? A so go-to? I don't, I don't have a go to set. I think that uh, there's always stuff you got to be working on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it depends, right? It depends on the set. The key is people don't realize like it's it's a lot harder in the sense that you have to make everything flow and find a way to tie everything together and do so succinctly. So you're typically only going to do a five to seven minute set. Um, I've tried to find opportunities. Like I did like a 15 minute set like last year at at a club and stuff like that. If you can find those opportunities, it's great. But to be able to keep people's attention and keep them going is hard, especially when you're like trying to tell stories or be a storyteller. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have like a great, you know, set to do on a, on a video. I think this might not be the best medium for, uh, for comedy. It's weird. I, I've seen like I, I'm a fan of comedy as well, and I've seen like uh, during the pandemic, like some clubs were trying to comedy clubs were trying to do you know uh, trying to do shows without yeah. people, and I was like, this is bad. Like this is hard Rough because these guys are awesome, but like I'm laughing at home. This isn't the same like at all as the experience right. of a live audience, and, mm-hmm. and that, that it's a it's a weird medium in that regard, right? Yeah. And um, what's the energy like when you're live performing? like that it's cool it depends on where you are right that that's going to vary from room to room and that varies from from audience to audience so you kind of have to read the audience based on what you're doing like i like it was weird i was doing a set once where i was talking i was telling jokes that some people found like half the room found hilarious and the other half of the room did not care for and then i started doing this bit i do about like duck cleaning like i was like i was like everybody's somebody's child everybody's you know a good person and i I don't know where i went with it but it's something effective like you know, everybody's a good person inside. You just got to get to know them. You know, for example, when I go to like try to get, get wedding stuff done, someone's trying to charge me $2 a slice to, to cut my own cake. So I, I got to pay $400 just to cut my cake. If I have 200 guests, that's ridiculous. Right. And then I tie into like, wait, the only people who don't have souls are guys who call you about duck cleaning. And then like, I go into a bit about that and I did that. And this whole side of the room that was silent, like got up and they were like, yes, this needs to stop. And they were like laughing and they were like going, and I was like, I was like, whoa, did not expect that. Like, I just assumed I should play to this side of the room because they love everything I'm doing. This side didn't get anything. Somehow duct cleaning got these guys up on their feet, just like uproariously laughing. It was hilarious. Like I was like, I was like, that's amazing (laughs) that you found that funnier than I found it. Cause I didn't think it was that funny, but I'm glad you found it that great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think the, the vibe in the room is different. It depends on where you're at, depends on who you are. Um, I personally have made a conscious decision. Uh, maybe it's not great um, to try to avoid like profanity in my standup. Uh, that's actually incredibly hard to do in this medium, which is full of profanity. That's like saying you want to be a clean rapper, right? That's like, how do you do that? So it actually makes things doubly difficult uh, to not fill with profane you know, language, because yeah. that's a very common thing. In fact, profanity is often used as a tool to bring, you know, laughter out of people by ton, tons of the greats, right? Yeah. So uh, that's actually really hard for me. But you know what, in my role, and maybe this is like, I don't know if this sounds weird, but you know, I'm accountable and, and responsible for a lot of young people. A lot of people look mm-hmm. up to me, you know, I can't, I can't go out be cussing on Mike, you know, one night and the next day, go, go teach the children, right? Like it's yeah. not, it's, it's weird. Not I can tell stories about the children that are hilarious and not, you know, in harm to them that bring joy to people, but I probably don't want to be cussing up a storm and then, you know, go to work the next day. It's, it's a bad example, right? Like, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what time is it anyway? It's 20 to 10. Are you have to, I think, uh, I think we can cut it there. Sure. To be honest. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Nice. That was fun, man. I, I really enjoyed that. That was that was that was really great. Uh, I apologize if I if I go off on tangents a little bit. No, I, I it's just, perfect. I enjoy I enjoy the medium of being able to like this this dynamic of us being able to just have a conversation is always mm. really fun. Yeah. Um, and there's tons of stories I thought we would dive into that we never did, yeah. uh, especially with life after high school. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe down the road we can we could share again or talk more. Done. Um, I'll I'll, I'll punch stories. that in for sure. 
Josh yeah, man, this, round this too. Nice. Yeah, this this was awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, I'm glad. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy with a thousand different things going on. You're about to get married. Like, yeah, it's chaos. Going on. It's absolute chaos. This yeah. pandemic has been uh, has really been a character Shwack. tester. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every day of the week, we find like a new problem. It's 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 crazy. That's incredible. Yeah, there's like there's there's new challenges around. I think uh, mm-hmm. I think it's weird, but uh, we're only given the crosses that we can we can carry, right? So uh, so any challenges that you face in life, you want to make sure that you realize that you know you're probably up for this, no matter how difficult or how hard it is in the moment. And I have to remind myself of that all the time, especially in the last couple of months, uh, because of some of the difficult things I've had to go through. Uh, but the reality is, you know, you got to balance your life. You got to try and find opportunity for fun and for joy. And, uh, you know, stuff like this, this was great. This was uh, yeah. a great joy for me to do. It was nice, nice to talk to parents all day and do marketing and teach. But uh, it's great to just, you know, chop it up a little bit and, uh, yeah. and chat for a bit and, and, and share. Uh, so thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. I appreciate uh, everything you do. And I, uh, I hope we get to roll soon. Might yeah, not be as soon sure, as we like, man. but nice yeah I, I it's been it's been a little bit weird my fiance christine and i have been have been training a lot together so doing a lot of video study and then try to build off of that and, and drill and work on specific skills so that's been really cool uh, unfortunately she's getting like much better so i'm getting the crap kicked out of me by the same person like all the time uh so that's uh, challenging uh but overall i'm looking forward to uh to getting to roll with other people as well and, nice. and getting to do a lot of visiting once once it's safe yeah. to do so right uh, right so yeah that'll it'll be, it'll be but... awesome yeah, soon enough, man. So next time we chat, I gotta bring like a dope hat. Cause, I think uh, so too. Because I'm digging it. It's good. I nice. tried to wear the fortune cookie shirt to bring a little bit of a little bit of joy to the conversation, but uh, that was about it. Dude, I'll be honest. Halfway through, I was like, fortune cookies. That's what they are. I was like, I was like, bananas. No. Why would half be peeled, <laughs> half not be peeled? No, they're not yellowing up their page. But fortune cookie. 